Good morning, church. You know, as John was up here praying over the offering, I want to let you know something, John. Your wife says the same thing about you. Where did you come from? She asks it over and over. I know Angie does. Pray for Angie, everybody, please. <laughs> you know, as I was praying for God to give me the words to speak here this morning, he kept asking me uh, one question. It seemed like a simple question the first time he asked me. Are you giving everything you have? Are you all in this morning? And you know, when he first started putting that question on my heart, and I started to pray on that, I thought, I am God. I volunteer. I don't have any more hours in the day to volunteer. I give financially every week. I'm training my child up in the way of the Lord. I'm training both my children up in your word. I, I'm giving everything I have, God. I'm all in. But the more I prayed about that question, the more complex the question got. You see, the more I prayed about that question, I understood that God was actually asking me to dig even deeper. Because none of us, as we sit here right now, are all in. None of us are giving everything we can. We are all greedy when it comes to some aspect of our lives. We are all hoarding something that God is asking us to give away. Don't believe me? Follow me through scripture because I'm going to show you what God showed me when it comes to that question. This morning God is asking you, are you putting in everything you have? Are you all in this morning? If your response is like mine it was initially, yes, God, I am. I'm giving everything I've got. This word is for you. You see, I know a lot of you are sitting in here thinking, I just put in a, an offering. Listen, I volunteer a couple hours a week. I talk to my coworker. God wants more than that. You see, God quickly reminded me of the fact that he sees what you do. He knows that you offer, put an offering in at the church. He knows that you paid for the guy's lunch or the lady's lunch behind you to drive through line. He knows that you're a volunteer coach. He knows that you pray with your kids at bedtime. He knows that you pray with your spouse at dinner. But he wants more. He wants all of you. He wants everything that you have to offer. He wants you to offer it. The very first place God sent me to clarify the question, and more importantly, to clarify his commands and his expectations of us, is Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. And it's there, scripture says, As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All of these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. And you see, as God took me through that passage, he stopped me in a couple key points and clarified some things. The first place he stopped me was Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 2. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. You see, what God wanted us to know, very, to, to lead off the entire question and to lead off his expectations of you, he sees the rich and the poor. When he looked down and saw the people giving their money, Jesus Christ saw the rich people and he saw the poor people. He sees everybody. As you sit here this morning, I don't care what your current predicament is. I don't care if you're stuck in addiction. I don't care if your bank account has a minus sign to lead off with. I don't care if your bank account has six figures in it. God sees you all the same. Been through a divorce, been married for 30 years, God sees you all the same. Stuck in addiction, never once had a sip of alcohol, God sees you all the same. We are all the same in God's eyes. He does not play favorites. As he looked down and he saw the people giving their money, he didn't say, oh, look, these people are more important. This guy over here gave $50,000 and this lady gave two coins. I'm going to spend most of my attention on these rich people. God didn't do that. He saw everybody, and he sees you regardless of your stature in life. He sees you regardless of your position at work. He sees you. Jesus Christ does not show favoritism. Your profession makes no difference to Jesus. It doesn't. He sees you, period. Romans chapter 10, verse 12 says, There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. The same Lord is the Lord of all. The same Lord right now is the Lord of the richest man or woman that lives in Charleston, Illinois. It's the same Jesus Christ for the guy that sleeps over the overpass on I-57. It's the same Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the same Christ 
for the president of the bank as he is for the guy who's sleeping on the corner of Lincoln Avenue or asking for your change as you exit the Walmart parking lot. It's the same Christ. He sees everyone the same. The problem is we don't. You see, the problem is we categorize people all the time. We pay attention to the people that give more to us. We pay attention to those people. We, we pay special attention to the people that serve our purposes, that, that can do something for us. But when is the last time that we have done something for someone that we know can't possibly repay the favor? When's the last time we've done that? The person with the master's degree, the guy with the high, that's a high school dropout, same Christ. The lady that's been married to her husband for 50 years, the lady that's had five divorces, same Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ blesses all who call on him. So the question is, have you called on him? Have you called on Christ? Understand that God sees you. That widow in that story, she knew that she was not rich. She knew that she was outnumbered when it came to her finances in that crowd. But it did not stop her from stepping forward and giving everything she had. You see, a lot of us find ourselves in this predicament where we're afraid that the world's going to ridicule us. So we just stay on the sidelines. I'm not going to step up and volunteer in the kids' ministry. I'm not going to do that because I've got no background in that. People are going to see my deficiencies. They're going to ridicule me. I'm not worthy. I'm not equipped. I can't do it. I'm not going to stop and pray with the homeless guy on the corner of Lincoln Avenue and 4th Street because I'm not very good at prayer. And then this guy is going to know my deficiencies. He's going to see how I fall short, and I'm going to be embarrassed. We are to take our lesson from the widow here in, in Luke. She did not care who saw her. She knew that she was poor. Her clothing probably showed that. She was probably unkept. Her hair was probably a mess. She probably didn't have any makeup on, no perfume. And she's walking into this crowd with people in suits and ties and people with clean clothes and cologne or perfume. You see, she was walking into a situation where she was the outcast. But God did not care. Jesus Christ saw that lady, and more importantly, Jesus Christ saw the lady's heart. The second place God stopped me was verses 3 through 4. Jesus Christ says this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Jesus Christ said all these people gave gifts out of their wealth. All the wealthy people were just giving God what they had left over. You see, they still had tons of money in the bank. I'm just going to give God what's in my pants pocket. I'm going to give him my spare change. And you see, for the rich people, the, the spare change that they carried around in their pocket was significantly more money than the widow. Way more money. And that was just their spare change. But God saw that. You see, when they put their coins into the offering, Jesus Christ didn't just see the monetary amount of money that they were putting in the offering. He saw their heart. He knew they are not giving me all they have. They are giving me all they want to give me. The widow, Jesus said, this lady right here, she is literally giving me everything that she has to live on. Because when Christ looks at you, and when Christ looks at what you're giving back into the kingdom, he's looking at your heart. He's not looking at a dollar amount on the check. He's not looking at how many $20 bills are in, the, in your hand when you put in the offering. You know, if you're anything like me, offering used to make me so uncomfortable when we were new believers. I hated offering. I hated it. I'm not going to lie, we picked a church that didn't even do an offering until you walked out the building, you just put it in the wood chest. It made me highly uncomfortable. And any time I ever attended a church that did an offering, I'd always crinkle mine up real small. That way the person next to me might say, well, maybe there's three 20s in there. And some of y'all are doing the same thing. Don't, don't, hey, listen, you can laugh, but some of y'all are doing the same thing. Don't worry about what the person next to you thinks. Don't worry about that. Take your cues from the widow. Listen, what you decide to give is between you and God. None of us in this building are going to judge you. Somebody in this room right now put in a dollar, most likely. Praise God. Thank you for that. God bless you for that. Somebody in this room probably dropped a $100 bill in the same offering tub. Guess what? Jesus Christ sees both of you. He sees both of you, and he sees your heart. 
And that's all that's important. But let me tell you something. As I went through this passage and I went through this question, are you given everything you have? We immediately default to money. That's immediately what we think about. And although the finances of the church are very important, listen, we feed homeless people out of the money you put in this offering. We pay electric bills for widows. We pay mortgage payments for, for couples that have fallen on bad times. We've paid car payments. We have kept lights on. We've kept water flowing. We've bought formula. We do things for people in this community because you do things for the kingdom of God, and that's how it works. That's why your money is important. But there's something that's even as important, maybe even more important than your money, and it's your time. You see, as God asked me, are you giving everything you got? He's not just talking about money, folks. He's not just talking about that. That is such a small piece of the puzzle. Are you giving everything you've got when it comes to your time? You see, a lot of times we get greedy when it comes to our money, but we get just as greedy, if not more so, when it comes to our time. Yeah, I know my coworkers have been struggling with addiction, but I do not have time to talk to them during the workday. I've got too much to do. I've got too many emails to respond to. I'm too backed up on paperwork. I do not have time to pray with him. Yeah, I know my mom or dad is stuck in addiction. I don't have time to deal with that. Listen, they're adults. They can figure it out on their own. I've got my own life to live. I've got my kids. I've got my spouse. I'm too busy. I have to work overtime because I just bought a new car. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to mow the yard. I have to do whatever. I don't mow my yard, actually. Grayson, thank you for mowing. Great. Hey, listen, if you need a yard mowed, we have a gentleman in church right now that owns a mowing business. He does a phenomenal job. So I was, I was up here saying, I don't have time because I'm on my yard. I looked out and saw Grace, and I thought, Grace knows that's a fib. So I'm just going to announce it right now. <laughs> Hold me accountable, brother. Grayson does a phenomenal job on yards. So that's just a little side note. That's not even in the notes, Grayson. <laughs> but we do it all the time. We make excuses for why we can't help people because we don't think we have time to do it. I've got too much to do. But we are called to help other people. Jesus Christ wants your time just as much as he wants you to financially support the church that you attend. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Listen, it doesn't cost you one penny to take time out of your day to pray with someone. It's completely free. That coworker that has the burden of addiction on their back, help them carry that burden. Do what Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 tells you to do. Take the time to pray with that person. Love them. Cry with them. Minister to them. And do it with all your might. Just like that widow did. Hold nothing back. When it comes to your coworker and the prayer they need, put everything you've got on the table for them. Take all the time that you have, not just that you want to give, take all the time that you have to ask them if, you, if they would like you to pray with them. Spend time with those people. Do it with all your might. That friend that's going through a nasty divorce, they do not need your money, people. The, your friend that is in a, in a rough time, the family member, your parent, your spouse, your sibling, that you cannot solve all of their problems by writing them a check. They need your time and your prayers. Do not give them what you have left over. Do not be like the rich people in the story of Luke. Be like the widow. Dig deep into your pockets. Look in that schedule. Find as much time as possible to help minister to other human beings. Give them your all. Give them what they need, not just what you have left over. Give them your undivided attention. Not because you have to, but because you want to. Love them, just like that widow did. Pray with them, just like the widow did. The, ex the examples go on and on. Your parent that's diagnosed with cancer, your sibling that's in addiction, your depressed coworker, your neighbor that's stuck on drugs, the complete stranger at Walmart that you can look at and tell something is wrong. We are called to be givers, church, not takers. And it's time we take that instruction seriously. 1 John chapter 3, verses 17-18 through 18 says, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, 
Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Let us not love in words or speech, but in actions with love and truth. You see, we are quick to love each other with words. You see it on Facebook all the time. It drives me crazy. Someone puts a prayer request out, and everyone types on there, I'm praying. And it's a race to see who can type it first. Because then the person thinks that we actually care about what's happening in their lives. All of you have done it at some point or another. So have I. You have typed on a Facebook post. I'm praying for you, brother. And you put these little hands on there that makes your post really important. There are these little claspy hands. And <laughs> you laugh. You do it. I do it too. Listen. But then you scroll down to the next post. You don't even pray. Most of us have done it at some point or another. Listen, if you're not going to pray for somebody on their, in their specific need, in their specific request, do not put that on there. That is not being honest. If you are going to post something to somebody, then actually pray for them. But here's, what, here's a really novel idea. This is something that was God really laid on my heart this week. How about this? How about the next time you see your friend post a prayer request on Facebook, don't post anything on their Facebook page. Go to their house. Drive to their house, pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, can we go have coffee? I saw your request on Facebook. Listen, I don't just want to be generic because when we type that on Facebook, here's what we're doing. We're reaching into our pocket and we're throwing our spare change at them. That's all we're doing. You're not giving everything you have, neither am I, when we act like that. What we're doing is what the rich people did back in the story of Luke. We're just giving the kingdom our spare change. Listen, I don't have time to talk to him. Actually, I'm just going to type it on here on Facebook because and then I'm going to move on to my next task. You see, we are giving people a false sense of friendship and companionship when we do that. The next time your friend needs something, go to them. Pick up the phone and call them. Treat them to a coffee. Treat them to lunch. Whatever the case may be. Actions, church. Remember what that verse says in John. Let us not love in words and speech, but in actions. Take action when it comes to intercessory prayer. Be an active participant. Engage them on behalf, engage Christ on behalf of them. Show them how to pray. Listen, maybe you don't think you're very good at it. That's fine. Who cares? Pray. The only way you're going to get better at it is if you do it. Give them your time, give them a, a, your attention, and give them your prayers. It's time to get involved, church. It's time that the body of believers in Jesus Christ, it's time we quit being so dang passive. You see, that's why the world continues just to erode and erode and erode, is because we as believers don't stand up and do anything about it. We're passive. We want someone else to solve the problem. We delegate what Christ tells us to do. This theme that God had me on about taking action reminded me of another story in Scripture. God took me to Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 through 14. You see, because there are stark similarities between the widow and the widow's might and Noah, there, there are a lot of similarities in these two stories. Genesis chapter 6. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. Does that not sound familiar? That sounds like you're reading a newspaper. God saw how corrupt the earth had become. For all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. Remember, God saw Noah. Okay, God saw him. And we remember back to the story in Luke that God sees everybody the same. God sees everybody the same. Did you know that Noah had a problem with alcohol? Did you know that? Were you aware of that? You see, when we read these stories in Scripture, when we read these stories, we think everybody in the Bible was perfect. Well, God used Noah because he was perfect. Wrong! God used Noah because Noah was willing to do what God asked him to do. That's why God used him, and he's going to do the same thing with you. Noah had many, many imperfections. He was not a perfect person. There never has been one. Noah was flawed, majorly flawed, but God used him because God knew that Noah would listen to what he was asking him to do. He was asking Noah to build an ark. He was asking Noah to give of his time and of his labor, and he was going to save humanity through Noah building this ark. 
And when Noah was asked to do that by God, he had an option. He could either build the ark like God asked him to do. He could have had his kids do it. He could have made his kids build the ark. He could have paid another family to build the ark. Noah had options. And when God is asking you to do something, you have the same exact options that Noah had. You can either do it just like God has asked you to do it. You can make someone else do it for you. Or you can ask someone to do it for you. Or you can pay somebody to do the same task. The addict in your life, think back. You ever had an addict in your life? We send them to someone else all the time. We send them to somebody else. And listen, there's a time and place for, for rehab facilities. Those things are important. But when's the last time that you prayed with your addicted family member? When's the last time that you prayed for them? God has given you the instructions to build the ark for the addicted person in your life. And it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. The next time you encounter somebody that's stuck in addiction, remind them of that scripture. Help them look for the exit ramps. God says right here, if you ever are tempted, I will provide you a way out. So instead of telling the person in your life that's addicted how miserable they are and how wrong they are and how stuck they are in this addiction and how much they need to clean their act up, why don't you help them find the road map and help them look for the exit signs that God is providing them in their life? There's a real good chance that you see the exits for them. When you're stuck in that addiction, you don't see the exit ramps. Help them look for the exit signs, church. They are there. Scripture tells us right here they are. So if we're not helping people do that, it's because we are delegating what Christ is asking us to do. You have marital problems here this morning? You know, the first thing we do in, in signs of a troubled marriage, we, we, we immediately start thinking about divorce. We delegate what Christ is asking us to do to the courthouse. We ask other human beings to settle the marriage for us. Even though God has given you the instructions in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 or chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love perseveres. The question is, will you and I? You see, God says right here, love always perseveres. So if you are giving it all you have, you are guaranteed right here, these are the instructions to build the ark. You have trouble with your child? We make the schools deal with it. Even though God has given you the instructions to that ark as well, the question is, are you all in like the widow? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 says, Start children off in the way that they should go, and even when they are old, they will not depart from it. You are guaranteed right now if you train your child up in the way of the Lord. Scripture tells us right there when they're old, they will not depart from it. The question is this morning, are you starting them off on the way of the Lord? Are you all in? You see, when it comes to our kids, we delegate so much to the schools. We make the schools teach them what's right and wrong. Your kids need to learn what's right and wrong from you, church. You are the example for your kids. The schools are not there to raise your children. They are there to teach them. They are there to monitor them throughout the day. But when it comes to raising your kids and instilling the moral values that you want your kids to carry into the future, that is your job. That is my job. We are in this together, and we've got to do a better job of doing what Christ has asked us to do. When it comes to your kids, are you all in, or are you depending way too much on the schools, church? Coworkers giving you problems, we go straight to the boss. We go straight to the boss. Anytime we have a problem with an, any other employee. Christ gives us the blueprint to that ark in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. You see, we tend to outsource all of our issues to somebody else. 
The first time that somebody sins against you, you tell everyone in the world how mad you are at that person before you ever go to them. When someone has wronged you, you, you put them on blast, right? That's what the young kids call it, putting them on blast. <laughs> Back when I was a kid, they called it just getting your face ripped off. And I got mine ripped off a lot of times. <laughs> but we do that when somebody makes us angry, when someone sins against us. That's not what Scripture says to do. Listen, to be all in means to go to the person one-on-one -on -one and have a respectful conversation with that person. And then there are further instructions if that doesn't work. Read Scripture, there are further instructions. Noah could have done the same thing. He could have outsourced this job of the ark. But instead of doing that, Noah took initiative. Noah took action. Remember, Scripture tells us not to love with words all the time, love with action. That's what Noah did. He set forth in building the ark. Here's what we tend to do, though, when God tells us to build the ark. And I have also been here. I understand this because I did this once. When we lived in Terre Haute, I did not want to volunteer any of my time. I was so selfish with my time, my time was my time. And I was not going to give anybody any of it. So what I would do on Sunday mornings, I would just write the biggest check I could afford to write. I'd put it in the offering bin at the church. And I would consider my job done for the week. I felt good about what I've done because I was judging other people in my mind. Hey, I know I gave more than this guy. I know I gave more than this lady. God's surely looking at me with favor. He's surely looking down on me and saying, man, I wish you were more like Brandon. Wrong, because you know what I didn't know? The guy that was given $15 also went and gave groceries to the homeless guy on the street corner. The guy that only gave $15 was praying for his addicted co-worker. The guy that only gave $15 was volunteering all over the community. What was really happening is God was looking down at the guy that was given 15 bucks, and he's saying, man, I wish Brandon was more like him. You see, we get it so backwards in our mind, church. God wants your time. The world needs your time. Once you get, have a giving heart and you start giving with your time, I can guarantee you right now, your desire to give financially will follow right behind that. Focus on giving of your time first. Focus on giving of your talents and then your treasure you will just want to give. It'll just come naturally. But we are so greedy with our time. God wants you to give people your time. He's given you the instructions just like he gave Noah. Noah's was to build an ark. Here's our instructions. Mark chapter 12, verses 30 through 31. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind and all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbors yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. That's it, church. If you read that verse, Christ tells us right there, there's no commandment greater than these. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Very few of us meet the mark when it comes to that. Very few of us, when it comes to that scripture, are all in. A lot of us like to convince ourselves that we are. I do all the time. I'm all in, God. You know, the homeless guy waved to him. And I lift him, I'm praying for you, brother. No, that's not good enough. Stop and pray. Stop and pray for that person. God will show up. You know, I was out of my comfort zone one time. I was driving home from Terre Haute. I still carry this receipt in my wallet. I was driving home from Terre Haute. I used to see this homeless guy sleeping on a bench. Every single afternoon on my way home, he was sleeping on the same bench. And God told me very clearly, I want you to stop and pray for that man. I want you to stop and I want you to buy a $10 gift card at McDonald's. And the next time you see him on that bench, I want you to stop. I want you to pray for him. I want you to hand him the gift card and I want you to leave. That's all I want you to do. So I stopped on my way home one afternoon and I bought the gift card. And I thought, please, God, don't let him be on the bench. Please, Lord, do not let this man be on the bench. And I drove by, and I got to the stoplight, and guess who was on that bench? The homeless man. I knew he would be there, but guess what I did? I freaked out. The light turned green, and I thought, there's people looking, there's people behind me. I'm out of here, and I left. And I felt so bad about that for days and weeks. And I thought, I'll get him on Monday, God. I'll get him on Monday. Monday came. I was driving home from work. Guess who was not on the bench on Monday? The homeless man was not there. And immediately I thought, I have messed up. 
God had asked me to build the ark. God had asked me to help this man on this bench. And I didn't listen. I stopped and I got the gift card, but I didn't stop and pray with the man. I skipped the most important step, and I thought, I have ruined it. I have neglected my instructions from God. And I carried that with me for days, church. I went by that bench on Tuesday, on Wednesday. I would circle back through in the evenings hoping he was on the bench. And he was not there. Do not miss an opportunity to bless somebody if God is asking you to do that. But listen, even if you have skipped that opportunity and you think it's too late, it's not too late. About three weeks later, I was on my way home from work. And guess who was on the bench? The homeless guy. I pulled into the parking lot of Jimmy John's across the street. I walked across the street through traffic. People were angry at me because I was jaywalking in Terre Haute. <laughs> it's a different crowd over there, church. You don't jaywalk in Terre Haute. But I did because I was on a mission. I was going to get that man this gift card, and I was going to pray with him. And I woke him up out of his slumber, and he was so obviously intoxicated. Matter of fact, just breathing, I thought, man, I don't know if I can walk back to my car. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I prayed with that man. He was not happy that I woke him up. But I said, hey, brother, I'm just going to pray with you. I'm going to put my hand on your shoulder. I'm going to pray with you. I have a gift card for McDonald's. I want you to take this and get something to eat. He rolled back over. He had no interest in what I was saying at all. But I did what God asked me to do, knowing that that's what my job was. I knew God would use that in some way, fashion, or form. I knew he would bless the man. I went home. Man, I was on cloud nine. I'm going to tell you, when you follow God's instructions, it is a spiritual high that you will want to chase over and over again. And as I drove home, I was on cloud nine. And I remember very distinctly, my son came up to me. There was a couple times that my son had been with me in the car and we'd saw the homeless man together. And my son said, hey, Dad, he said, I saw that homeless man on the bench today. And he said, I said a prayer for that homeless man that he would send him some food today. And I immediately had the opportunity to teach my son the fact that God answers prayers because I had just stopped that afternoon and prayed with the man and gave him the gift card. You see, God even used my ignorance he used my laziness, and when I finally stopped and gave that man the gift card, I realized it had nothing to do with the homeless man on the bench. God was wanting to teach my children a lesson through my obedience, church, and he will do the same thing with your family. Sure, the homeless man was blessed. He got to eat that day, but my son learned a lesson there that he will carry with him the rest of his life, and if you are obedient to Christ... If you are obedient to Jesus Christ, he will do the same exact thing with your family, church. Listen to him and obey him, knowing that there are lessons much larger than you. When God asked me to do the, go get the gift card and pray with the man, he was just using me like he used Noah. The gift card was not even for me. He was just using my obedience, church. And he will do the same thing with you. We go back to the story in Luke. The last place God stopped me was the last 14 words of the whole scripture. Jesus looked up. He saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, the poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. Listen to these last four words, but, or 14 words. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had. What Scripture's telling us there is she, when she couldn't afford to give it, gave it. She, even after working a double shift, gave it. He, even after working at that second job, gave it. God wants you to give it even when you don't think you have it to give, church. Because guess who gives you what you do have? God. So if he's asking you to give it, he's not going to run you on empty. He's going to fill you back up so that you can continue passing it out, church. You just test me on that. Test, test God on that. He tells you to. Test me on this. That's the only thing God tells you to test him on in Scripture. You will not outgive him. I guarantee you, you won't. If you give your time, he will free up more time for you to give because that's what he wants you to do. When the rubber meets the road, church, and you have someone in your life that needs your time, this is something else we do. 
we think, man, they really need my advice. Listen, they need, to, they need me to intervene. When someone in your life needs you, they don't need you at all. What they need is God, and you have the instructions. That's why you're important. Listen, we don't do anything on our own that makes us important. We're, we're not important. We're not any more important than the person beside us, right? We're all the same. What The reason God will use you is because he's given you the instructions, just like he gave Noah. The question is, are you going to go all in when it comes to implying these instructions? We don't have any of the answers. God does. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 16. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. That is an instruction, church. We know that to be true. So if, if knowing that to be true, you know someone in your life that has not accepted Christ, it's time to go all in to make sure they understand this scripture. You see, it wasn't good enough for Noah just to tell his family, hey, God told me a storm's coming. He gave Noah the instruction to keep his family safe. It's not good enough for you to go to your unsaved loved one and say, one of these days, if you don't accept Christ, you're going to be in hell. No, it's your job to lead them to Christ. It's your job to build the ark for them. It's your job to reach into your pocket and not just throw your spare change at them, but give them everything you've got just like that widow did. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 says, Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, re rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Use the gifts that God has given you to serve other people. We use our gifts for our own self-interest. We do it all the time. We do it all the time. When is the last time you used the gift that God has given you to serve somebody else and not expect something back in return? Maybe some of you know how to fix cars. Listen, I promise you right now, Grayson, I'm not going to act like I can fix cars. I am uh, not a mechanic. If you come to me and your car is broken down, you might as well buy yourself a bicycle because that car will never run again, I promise you. It's not my gift, but I know people who have the gift. When is the last time you reached out to that single mother that lives in your neighborhood that's having car problems and offered to look at her car for free? Hey, I'm going to come look at your car. I think we can get this thing back up and running. What is your gift, church? Have you been blessed financially? When's the last time that you just singled someone out in your life that you know is struggling and just wrote them a check and put it in the mail, not expecting anything back in return? When's the last time that you've done that, church? Are you blessed when it comes to teaching kids? You know, we just heard from Miss Kylie, we need help. Are you blessed with children and, and, and a passion to teach kids? It's time to stand up and say, I'm willing to help. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. When is the last time that you've prayed with another human being? Lots of us are married, and we, we can't even answer that. When's the last time you prayed at the dinner table or, or made your kids pray over dinner? When's the last time? Listen, we all know how to pray, and it's free. It doesn't cost you one penny. That is something that we can give people for free. <clears throat> I'm going to close with this. <clears throat> Think back to that story again in Terre Haute. You know, we lived in Terre Haute for about 11 years. And we attended the same church basically the whole time that we lived there. It was a small congregation, probably of maybe 50 people on a Sunday. And we were dedicated to that church. We were dedicated to Jesus Christ, and we felt the Holy Spirit in that church. So we invested in that church. And we gave every single week. <clears throat> but looking back on my time in Terre Haute, I will tell you something. God used every dollar that we put in the offering. He did. He used every dollar. And that church did some amazing things for the community as well. But there was no amount of money. There was nothing I did in Terre Haute that was more important than that $10 gift card from McDonald's. There is nothing more important. If God is asking you to do something right now today, stop telling yourself it's too small. 
That's what we do. It's only a $10 gift card. God, I gave $200 last week at church. I mean, the $10 can wait. God wants the $10 gift card. God wants the $5 bill to the homeless man. You see, the differences are made in those $10 gift cards. The differences are made when you stop, stop whatever's going on in your life and you pray with somebody. We get so busy in today's world, we think we're so busy, we don't have time to even think half the time. Our schedules are packed full, and I am right there with you. My schedule is jam-packed full. It's so, I'm not lying, church. My wife looked at me the other day and said, do you even have time for that? And sometimes it's okay if the answer to that question is no, I don't. Don't put so much on your plate that you don't have time to stop when God asks you to stop to help people. If you are too busy to stop and pray with someone, you're too busy. It's time to scratch some stuff off the calendar. And if we all stand up and volunteer in our communities, we don't have to have certain amounts of people doing all the volunteer work. Because if everybody's on the volunteer list, we can all scratch some stuff off of our calendar and we can focus on the people in our lives that need the prayer. You will not give anything more valuable this week than a helping hand or a prayer to another human being. I don't care what you do all week. There's nothing more important than getting people in touch with Jesus Christ. You know, I think back to that story, Noah building that ark in his backyard. His neighbors had to think he was absolutely insane. It was not even raining, and he's building this big ark in his yard. I can't imagine what his neighbors thought. Look at, look at that drunk over there. He's an, like he's a moron. He's building a boat. It hasn't rained in six months. What is that crazy guy doing? There were people saying the same thing about me as I walked across that street in Terre Haute. Look at that lunatic going up to that drunk homeless man, giving him money. He's going to just go spend that on beer. Listen, it wasn't my job to tell that guy what to do with anything I gave him. That wasn't my job. My job was to do what God asked me to do. And your job is the same thing. I'm not going to volunteer my time. There's enough people. Other people should be doing that. I'm not going to stop and pray with that lady. She should have learned her lesson by now. I'm not going to go over and fix that lady's car. She shouldn't have had kids when she wasn't married. I'm not going to pray with him. That's his third DUI. He should have learned better by now. That's what we do, church. God is not asking you to judge anyone. He's not asking you to make a list of reasons in your head why you're not going to do what he asked you to do. What he's asking you to do is what he's asking you to do. Just focus on that part of it. It's other, it's other people's responsibility to, to be obedient to God as well. Do your part. Stop allowing somebody else's disobedience to make you be disobedient because that is what we do and we do it all the time the days of being a passive church church are over this world can no longer afford for us just to sit on the sidelines of life the world cannot cannot afford for us to delegate what Christ has asked us to do anymore your kids need the scriptures your kids need Jesus Christ. Your neighbors need Christ. We need more Christ in our schools. We need more Christ in the courthouse. We need more Christ in the prisons. We need more Christ in the jails. We need more Christ in our homes. Nobody is going to do that for you. If we continue to delegate what Jesus Christ has asked us to do, we will continue on the same path that we've been on for the last 50 years. You know, Einstein says the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. You know, by that definition, we are all insane, church. We turn on the news and we say, I can't believe there was another murder. Why can't you believe it? 
We're doing the same thing we did 10 years ago. We tell ourselves, man, I can't believe that this is so messed up. I can't believe the schools are messed up. I can't believe my job's messed up. I can't believe that my neighbor's still so screwed up in drugs. It's because we're doing the same exact thing that we've always done. It's time to do something different. It's time to read the instructions that God has given you. It's time to stop at McDonald's and get that $10 gift card and then stop with the homeless man and pray with him. It's time to do your part, church. There is someone in your life right now that is depending on you, that is waiting on you to introduce them to Christ. Figure out who that person is and then do exactly what God is asking you to do. God, we thank you so much for this word, Lord. We thank you for Family Worship Center. God, we thank you for the instructions of Scripture. We ask, Lord, that you give us the courage and the strength to go all in, God, to stop cutting corners, to get involved as believers in society, Lord, to get out of this corner that we've been shoved into, to not be embarrassed anymore to stand up and spread the gospel into the world, to not be scared of the repercussions that come with telling people we're a believer in you. God, give us the courage to do what you tell us to do, knowing that you will protect us just like you tell us you will, knowing that you will provide for us just like you tell us you will, and knowing that you will offer salvation to the lost souls that we bring to you just like you tell us you will. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.